بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حديث number 72 this hadith tells us and explains to us where an individual should stand when praying with another person in the hadith of Anas ibn Malik we learned that if they were two or more they should constitute a row but what about if it's an individual Hadith 73, Hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas, tells us what to do. Who will read this for us, inshallah? Narrated Ibn Abbas, Once I passed the night in the house of my aunt Maimuna, the Prophet stood for the night prayer, and I joined him, and stood on his left side, but he drew me to his right by holding me by the head. Al-Bukhari. Okay, then the Hadith is quite clear Ibn Abbas may Allah be pleased with him spent the night purposely at the house of his aunt and he pretended to be asleep it's a longer virgin and the author took only the portion that is required but the longer virgin goes to say that he spent the night to watch how the Prophet used to pray night prayer and this shows you that a student of knowledge acquires knowledge through any means possible and does not wait until knowledge comes to him. He goes in pursuit for that knowledge and that is why Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, he used to travel from Mecca to Medina to here and there following the companions of the Prophet ﷺ to learn from them and in one incident it was stated, I'm not sure if the Sahabi is Zayd ibn Thabit or Jabir ibn Abdullah, I forgot. But he went to his house and he was told that he was asleep. So he took his cloak, rolled it, used it as a pillow and slept at the doorsteps of the house. When it was time for Asr, the companion came out of his house and found Abdullah ibn Abbas sleeping at his doorsteps. So he said, may Allah have mercy and forgiveness over you, Abdullah ibn Abbas. Wouldn't you have woken me up? He said, no, we were instructed to do this with our scholars. Now who's saying this? The cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. One of the greatest companions of the Prophet and scholars of Islam. Yet he was junior to the other companions because they were all older than he was. And that is why he was respectful to them and getting the knowledge. One of the people of Medina says, he says, Abdullah ibn Abbas is much smarter than me. And his companions told him, why? He said, when we were young, in our teens, he said to me, don't you see that the companions of the Prophet are so many? Why not go and learn from them? And then I looked at him and said, Ibn Abbas, do you think that the people one day we'll need you and me why should we learn the companions are so many he says so he left me and 10 20 years later look what had happened ibn abbas is one of the greatest scholars of islam a great companion of the prophet i saw all the people go for him for fatwa and for knowledge and look at me i'm your regular guy so this shows you if you have a target and the target is sincere for the sake of Allah when you're young when you're strong when you don't have anything to occupy your time or engage you with then you have potentials with the grace of Allah you will go places you will become a scholar you will become an imam you will become a point of reference to people but if you don't, if you neglect and say, no, I would like to focus on my studies in this and in that. I would like to go and play football. I would like to spend some time reading comic books or Harry Potter or whatever. Then you will find that the people have advanced and left you way ahead of you. 
and it's very difficult for you to catch up. And this is what makes a person a potential scholar, a potential leader, an imam, and any normal human being. There is a difference. You can tell by the energy and the enthusiasm in acquiring knowledge, in occupying his time or your time in something that is useful. Ibn Abbas, look what he used to do when he was young. Spend the night, instead of going to play football or have fun with the kids, spend the night so that he can observe. And he did not tell the Prophet ﷺ. He pretended to be asleep. So he saw the Prophet when he performed wudu, when he slept, when he woke up in the middle of the night and he made wudu again and he recited the last 10 ayahs of Surah Al-Imran inna fi khalq samawati wal ardi to the rest of the ayahs and then he started to pray. Once he started to pray, he jumped and stood to the left of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet corrected him by holding his head and bringing him to his right hand side. And from this we learn where a man should stand next to another if they're praying in jama'ah. The Imam to the left and the Ma'mum to the right. Now, should there be a gap between them? Should the Imam be a little bit forward? Some scholars said yes. But the most authentic opinion is that there is no evidence. They should stand shoulder to shoulder. Of course, the Imam should be a little bit in line or a little bit ahead. But never the Ma'mum should be ahead of his Imam. And from this hadith also we learn that the difference of niyyah does not affect the prayer in case of the Imam and the Ma'mum. How is that? The Prophet started the prayer as what? As Munfarid, as an individual. And in the middle of the prayer he changed it from individual into congregation. So this is permissible. Why do I say this? Because a lot of the Muslims get cold feet and they freeze when when they pray sunnah after dhuhr for example and someone who did not pray dhuhr come and stand next to them and tap them on the shoulder saying I'm praying with you you're my imam or if three or four come behind him and they tap him lightly so that he would be their imam a lot of the Muslims what do they do they freeze <gasps> I'm imam how can I tell them that I'm praying sunnah? How can, you, you don't have to. Okay, should I change my niyyah into dhuhr? But I prayed dhuhr. Okay, initially I'm going to pray two rak'ahs. Should I change it and pray four rak'ahs? Akhi, don't change anything. You're praying two rak'ahs as sunnah, continue praying two rak'ahs as sunnah. And once you finish, offer salam, and they will complete their prayer. So you can change your intention from individual into an imam. You can also change your intention from an imam to a ma'mum, a follower. As we will get to know this insha'Allah. And there is nothing wrong in that. Suppose the person, the imam, he breaks wind while he's offering salah, then one of the muqtadi he can go ahead. Very good. If the imam nullifies his prayer or something happens to him, the man who was praying behind him, who was a follower, a ma'mum, now turns to be an imam. Also, there is a case, but we will come to know this later on. If the imam comes, if they call for the prayer, and a substitute leads the prayer, the first rak'ah, and all of a sudden, while they are, were in the middle of the first rak'ah, the imam comes. What does the imam do? He instructs the person leading the prayer to go, and he leads the prayer. And they, we will get to know this, inshallah, later on. So, in short, you do not have to have the intention to be an imam when you begin a prayer. You can shift and you can pray according to what you need. As long as you are praying with a niyyah and the ma'mum or the follower is praying with a different niyyah, this is okay. What's not okay is for you to change your niyyah from voluntary into fard, for example. This is not uh, permissible. But what is the ruling on if I was praying two rak'ahs sunnah of maghrib 
And the people came to pray behind me, who were late and could not pray, came to pray with me, Maghrib prayer. Should I raise my voice or keep it as it is? Now I'm leading, but I'm praying my two sunnah. So what do you think? Those who say, I must continue my prayer silently, raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Those who say that I may raise my voice as if I'm praying Fajr or Maghrib, raise your hands. And they are the majority and they are the right ones to say. Let's give you a rule of thumb. What is the ruling on raising the voice in loud prayers and keeping my voice down in silent prayers? Is it wajib? Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. We move on to a chapter that deals with imamah. This imamah we're referring to is the leadership of the prayer. And what are the rules and regulations governing this great form of worship? And we know that the best of all imams is the Prophet ﷺ. So how would we learn the rules of imamah? By observing his prayer and how the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, used to do with him. And it was he, the Prophet ﷺ, who said, إِنَّمَا جُعِلَ الْإِمَامُ لِيُؤْتَمَّ بِهِ It was the Imam was only made so that people would follow him. And he's the one who said, صَلُّوا كَمَا رَأَيْتُمُونِ أُصَلِّي Pray as you have seen me pray. So by combining these two hadiths, we can get a hint, inshallah, of what to do. Hadith number 74. Yes, brother. Narrated Abu Huraira. The Prophet وسلم, said, Isn't he who raises his head before the Imam afraid that Allah may transform his head into that of a donkey or his figure face into that of a donkey? Sahih al-Bukhari In this hadith, we learn that part of praying behind an Imam is that you do not raise your head before him. You do not act before him. And we will get to get more and more details about this because scholars say that the movements are four. Either you move ahead of your imam. So just as he's saying, Allah, you're already on the floor. And the guy is still up there saying, what are these doing? So this is completely prohibited because you are doing it in advance. Or you do it too late. When the Imam goes for sujood, Allahu Akbar, they wait and watch people all doing sujood and they're doing this. Nobody's watching them. As the Imam is about to raise his head, they go and prostrate. And this is completely forbidden as well. The third way is to immediately do it with him. Step by step, not before him and not after him. So as he is going for the ruku', you all go together. And this also happens in concluding the prayer. I've seen here a lot of the Muslims when the Imam says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, they're all doing this with him. As he goes to the left, they all go to the left. And the most authentic opinion is that after he finishes the second taslim, you start to make your first taslim. And that is why a lot of the Muslims, when they offer salam with the Imam, and they leave the Imam if he did a mistake and he wants to prostrate for sahu, they have already stood up or continuing their prayer because they're hastening in doing this. No, you should take your time. So following the Imam exactly with him is makruh. The first two is haram. The third one is makruh. This is not recommended. The fourth type is that you follow him Meaning that you do not move until he reaches the following pillar. So if he's in the standing position, he says, Allahu Akbar. You don't move until he is completely in the rukur position, then you move. When he falls to prostrate, you do not move until his forehead reaches the ground. And then you bend your back and knees and fall to the ground. And we will get more, inshallah, into this as we 
go on. In this hadith, the Prophet والسلام, is warning us that those who raise their heads from the bowing position or from the sujood position will be, they might be, and the threat is that their heads may turn into the heads of a donkey. We know that this had not happened. Alhamdulillah. However, the scholars say that because it did not happen, this does not mean it will not. Allah Azza wa Jal is capable. But we don't know when Allah chooses this. And some scholars say that those who raise their heads before their Imam, their heads turned into the head of a donkey, but metaphorically in the sense that those who do this are like donkeys in their stupidity and their idiot manner because they're doing something as if they're racing with the Imam and unfortunately a lot of the Muslims are like this racing the Imam but will you ever be able if you are in your bus to reach the station before the bus no matter what you do if you go from the back of the bus to the front very quickly you'll still reach the station after the bus so likewise when you start a prayer will you ever be able to conclude it before the imam take your time then take your time this is one of the ways of knowing how to feel khushur you're not going anywhere until the imam concludes the prayer so take your time say subhana rabbi al-a'la wa bihamdi and, and consider it and contemplate in it don't say subhana 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 I did 20. MashaAllah, so what? Do three with khushur, with concentration, better than 100. Islam focuses on quality, not on quantity. The Islam focuses on quality. We want to have 1,000 good Muslims rather than having a million of carry-on Muslims or drive through Muslims. These are not proper Muslims. We would like to have quality. So, the Prophet is giving this threat, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to make the people aware. The issue of praying behind an Imam is based on discipline. And it teaches the Muslims to be disciplined. And whenever you find Muslims undisciplined, you know that their Islam is on shaky grounds. We move on to hadith 75 and 76 and these two hadiths are very important and essential but before that do we have any questions? We have three questions. Sheikh this is regarding uh, hadith 72 on Baraka which you mentioned. Uh, I have read that Khalid bin Walid radiallahu he had two hairs of the holy prophet sallallahu which he used to keep in his cap. Now what was, was it for inspiration, blessings or out of love for the Prophet? We've stated, my brother, that the Prophet was the only one that was permissible for us to seek barakah through him. So by having his hair, some of the companions had this, and this was completely legitimate. He himself on Sulh al hudaybiyah when he was prevented from offering Umrah, so Allah instructed him to make tahallul from his ihram by shaving his head and by slaughtering his hadi and so he did and he instructed the companions to take parts of his hair not only that um sulaim the mother of anas it was reported in authentic hadith that the prophet slept in her house napped and he was sweating so she took a small bottle and collected the sweat of the Prophet ﷺ in that bottle. And the Prophet woke up and said, what are you doing? And she said that we are putting it with our musk and with our perfume and it makes it the best of perfumes. And the Prophet ﷺ and, and did not elaborate. So scholars say that this is only for the Prophet ﷺ and his traces. Look at these stories initially to know the status of the Prophet ﷺ in our hearts. We do not worship him. He's only a human being, but he is the top of the ladder. He's the best of all human beings, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's a servant of Allah. He's the chosen one. 
And he is the only one that we are allowed to seek the blessing and favor of Allah when he was alive. But after his death, we have to prove that these hair belongs to him or this sword or this cloak or these slippers or whatever. And this is not possible today. So whatever you heard about the companions, it was true, inshallah. Second question, Ashi. Sheikh, uh, in the hadith number 73 about Ibn Abbas, عنه, when he said that Rasul took him from his head and brought him to the side. From the back or from the front? Yes, this is a usual question that people ask. And we do not have an explanation or a detail. But most likely, if it was from the front, this is permissible because this is not him passing intentionally. This is the Prophet taking him to correct his position and this is inshallah permissible and there's nothing wrong in that. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program. If you have any questions, write them down. Inshallah we will try to devote more time for your questions next time. So until then, fi amanillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.